May, may I uh, now shift to you, Aminata, and you, Serge, uh, to, to, to give us uh, a view of where we are in terms of uh, outlook. Are we in a real recovery? Are we in major uncertainties uh, from what, what you see? And what could be the geopolitical or the political and social consequences of something which in a continent, in this continent, has been maybe a bit more a humanitarian issue and a real social issue, even more than a sanitary issue in a sense. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think that, first of all, WHO and the United Nations owe Africa an apology, and we are still waiting for it. It was announced that we would die by million. We didn't. We are very much here and standing. So that, apo that apologies are to be sent to us. Um, many theories, you know, uh, came up. That's because we were eating a lot of, we were taking a lot of, uh, uh, chloroquine uh, to fight malaria, that's why we were more resistant, etc. But I think it was just the result of the underestimation of the capacity and the abilities of African countries to, to, to deal with crisis. And yet, if, we, uh, if the analysis was made a little bit uh, deeper, um, WHO would understand that we have the biggest experience in terms of find, uh, fighting pandemics. I was prime minister when Ebola uh, struck in uh, uh, studying in, 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 in Sierra Leone, in, in Guinea, etc. Um, that's my experience that we fought it. Um, so we built upon that experience uh, to take the right decision in many countries. Um, that was not a complete lockdown. That was sometime halfway because it's, it wasn't possible to do what happened in Wuhan, impossible in, uh, in, in Africa. Uh, but the right measures, I think, helped uh, to contain and limit the damages. So that also needs to be clearly acknowledged. It's not by random that uh, we are the less affected. No, it's the result of sound decisions that were taken with huge, huge negative consequences. Um, let me take an example, Senegal, that's the easiest. Um, when the pandemic started, we were up to 7% of economic growth. 12 months later, we went under 1%. So that, that's huge, and it takes huge time to recover that. Um, let's also know that, uh, we do know that, but we, it's good to, to, to recall that, 70 to 85% of our economies are informal, which means that they are not recorded in the books. So these are uh, the noble people, as you call them, Prime Minister Zensu, um, who go day by day after their life trying to make a living day by day. So when you take restriction measures in terms of movement, limitation of uh, work time, I mean, you're affecting a huge cohort of populations. And it takes time to recover that, and we are still in a recovery phase, from what I see. Uh, so it's... Um, something that we also have to acknowledge that, and I've seen, I think that was two days ago, a study so it's a, saying that we might lose some life expectancy progress that we have done, we realize, over the, you know, the last decades just because of COVID. So we have to have a, 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 a broader understanding, uh, as you said, linking the social impact and the economic prospect. I think it's very, very important in the recovery phase, which means that we will have to put the money where the mouses are, which means that we will need also to support um, a sector that is vital, the informal sector. Of course, there is a whole discussion about how to move from informal to formal, but you know, we, we will carry on that discussion, but for the time being, we have to pick them up so people can come back to their regular uh, standards, um, you, and if you have if you have witnessed in many countries, including mine, um, few months after uh, uh, COVID, I mean we witnessed some unrest in many places. 
But the real reason was that it was unbearable anymore. People have lost their the, 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 the means of living um, and became uh, utterly poor. So if we want to uh, sort of look into the future, but at the same time, uh, that was a great experience to, to, to build upon from a governance perspective. Of course, as I said, for the poorest and the most vulnerable, that was a, you know, a dramatic experience and they're still recovering. But for the government, in terms of budgeting, uh, what it also, um, what lesson we have learned is that we can also count on our own strengths because that's what we have um, demonstrated. A great resilience um, in, the, in, the, in, in the front of what we have seen. Um, somehow, uh, COVID was sort of a wake-up call for dreamers like all of us. That's why I'm, you know, so uh, happy that this gathering ha is happening. Because the first uh, collateral damage of COVID was multilateralism. International cooperation was dead, as we know. It was impossible to move from a country to another. Uh, airplanes, everything, you know, went uh, closed. And of course, um, we all have witnessed the, the, the fight over, you know, this one the mask, let alone the vaccine. And that is also a question that is very important. So that's where it's important to link the health and the economy. Because and that's a slogan, but it's so real. Nobody's safe until we all are safe. I mean, we know that there is 194 UN membership, but if we don't take the right course of action, we would end up with 194 variant of the COVID. So we are in this crisis for a long time if we don't take the proper measures. But what we are seeing, nationalism around vaccine, countries would have even the means to, to, to buy and not having you know, anybody to, you know, uh, from who you can, you, can, you, can, you can buy the vaccine because people are now in third um, dose of vaccine while others, as uh, it was said, we are very privileged. Um, but how long we can sustain that and at the same time uh, expects to have a full recovery of uh, the international economy. So that is something that we really need to sort of reflect upon and um, link much more the economic community and the social community, maybe under the umbrella of forums like this ones, the UNs and, and others. Um, so that is... Uh, something that we, we, we really need to reflect upon. But we also learn, um, you know, from a governance point of view, that there are immediate and urgent action to be taken. It's how Africa is going to build its medical and pharmaceutical independence. For me, it seems like the, the critical question that uh, the African Union needs to, uh, to, to solve and to make progress upon. Um, that's what we have learned. Until you get, you know, uh, independent, when we because we, we we saw it, you know. I mean, that was really, really sobering, as a matter of fact. You know, we've been, you know, conceptualizing about globalization, the global village, etc. But we saw that we were very far from that. We immediately felt into, you know, a very hardcore nationalism that we haven't seen, I think, for a long time. Um, so. From an Africa point of view, I think we have to move forward in terms of having collective projects. Um, we are only commercing between ourselves up to 12%. In the rest of the world, it's 60% in Europe. I think it's a little bit less than 60% in Asia. We are just 12%, which means that we have a, a space to, 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 to grow. But we have to uh, sort of uh, go beyond the boundaries and, and see how we're going to put together, I mean, this major, major, major project. And the first one being, as I said, uh, the medical and pharmaceutical um, uh, independence, because the last thing we would like to see happening is COVID becoming sort of a public um, health permanent issues, you know, staying between one, two, three percent 
for the rest of the time. Uh, and if we don't take the course of the right course of action, that's what is going to happen. And we know who are the ones who are going to suffer the most, as we know it. Uh, you know, it's the same for all pandemics. It's going to be those who are the most vulnerable in rural areas, uh, you know, women and, and young people most of the time. So making the link between what happened and even the stability of the continent and the needs to have internal response to the challenges seems to be very important to me. That opened up the question about industrialization. That was the same thing. Because as we commerce only 12% between ourselves, um, we, we import most of you know, the goods that we consume. Um, we, not, we, we realize that, well, we have to produce simple goods and that's also an opportunity for you know, the, the, the rest of the world to invest in Africa. We, think that industrialization more than ever in the eyes of you know what we are the pandemics and the, the lesson learned from the pandemics i think uh, we cannot postpone any longer our industrialization pro you know uh, prospect um, and i think the good way to start might be in the pharmaceutical uh, sector but also in all sectors um, because we face also um, uh, the whole issue around procurement of simple things uh, syringe sometime. I mean, simple things. Uh, and that's the lesson that really we want to learn. Um, and it opened up also the, 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 the possibility of creating jobs in a continent where 70% of the population is below the age of 35. So it's a mix. Um, of course, we resisted. We've been resilient because we were the less affected and it's not by random. It's because we demonstrated capacities uh, in terms of taking the good actions. But at the same time, we suffered a lot because we didn't, of course, we didn't see uh, what we thought happened and was the reality. Multilateralism and international cooperation just was wiped off the, off the table. So we had to cut it to ourselves, which is a good thing. I think it reinforced our self-confidence and we have to carry it forward in terms of, as I said, our sovereignty when it comes to medical and pharmaceutical, but at the same time globally in terms of industrialization. So I think it's challenging, but at the same time, it's open up avenues that we have to courageously uh, take up. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Madam Prime Minister. Uh, you, you addressed the complexity of the situation and the dualism of the situation. Uh, I like very much <clears throat> when you say that uh, Africa has been resilient, has uh, beca <clears throat> become aware of its own strength, uh, has, be has been well uh, and quickly organized uh, in a sense, and globally was underestimated. Uh, so <clears throat> there was a performance of Africa, and the resilience is not a hazard. Yet, you are emph emphasizing uh, the informal sector situation, which is a major difference. that We share maybe with some countries in uh, the Indian subcontinent, <coughs> sorry, but which is very different from the rest of the world where 50% of our GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is made by the informal sector. Uh, in your country, it's probably 80% of employment. It's 90% in mine. But even in a bit more uh, advanced countries in terms of evolution, like Maghreb, uh, it remains 30 to 40% of the employment. And the number one uh, creator of new jobs. Yet, uh, we had no means for the government to support efficiently this informal sector and the SMEs in general in our countries uh, are, are very small uh, uh, firms. Uh, we had not the same uh, public finance resources 
uh, to support the households and the SMEs and the corporate world in general. Nothing like in the OECD countries. So it's very important that you emphasize that uh, it, it, it has made aware everybody in Africa and I think in part of Asia of the fact that we have to define new governance rules and develop the independence. And you said in the health system, in the manufacturing system, uh, it will accelerate the trend to a major change of our economy. Uh, because yes, we can, in certain extreme situations, be efficient, but we have structural uh, weaknesses. What is important is that we know that we, we can address them and tackle them. And that is a major change. It's not purely a question of recession and recovery. It's a major change for the, for the future. Thank you.